Hi, this is Dr. Eckhart. Um, previously, in the previous uh, slideshow, we talked about why we developed Progestel. We found that a number of competitors were using estrogenic herbs and also um, perhaps some toxic ingredients as well. Again, many of our competitors have preservatives in their cream uh, that uh, contain preservatives that are estrogenic. And that's because um, progesterone cream um, is just water and oil mixed together and the water by default um, has to contain a preservative to keep out the bacteria. In the previous slideshow we also talked about estrogen dominance and uh, the symptoms of estrogen dominance as well as what it means. And also we found out that um, hormone disruption, the most common cause of hormone disruption is estrogen mimicry. The chemical or herb just kind of looks like estrogen but it's really a weird estrogen. It does strange things to your body. But in addition, there are progesterone blockers, things that actually elevate your own estradiol, and testosterone blockers as well. Today, um, we'll be talking about um, iodine deficiency and um, the importance of iodine in these estrogen dominant diseases, such as um, ovarian cysts, breast cysts, fibroids, and also um, um, pelvic pain, such as. Um, with disease with endometriosis. We'll talk about how to use the progesterone and also the dosage. Okay, this is uh, talking about iodine deficiency and uh, we're just recently learning about this and we've had a lot of luck um, treating patients with this. Um, according to uh, Brownstein MD who um, is up in Michigan, practices up in Michigan, he wrote a book, Iodine, Why You Need It. I suggest that you might get the book at Amazon.com. 94.7% of Americans are deficient in, um, in uh, Michigan out of 500 patients. It turns out that um, there was a wide swath of um, goiters in America, and it was, used to be called the goiter belt. And uh, it turns out that in the Midwest, in the Great Lakes region, um, there is a, a goiter belt where people were deficient in iodine. So it turns out that iodine um, was in the oceans and um, that seaweed, here's kelp in, on the side, kelp concentrates iodine and so that's why you eat seaweed to get iodine. So in the Midwest the glaciers had carved out the Great Lakes and took away um, any evidence of the ocean, the previous prehistoric oceans. And so in the soil um, there's no uh, iodine um, there's no previous ocean and uh, there's no iodine in the, in the fruits, vegetables, and meat grown in the, in the Midwest. That's why there's a large goiter belt in, in the Midwest. So um, it, uh, right about, I believe it's in the mid-1800s, I'm not sure, maybe somebody can correct me, um, that um, they, uh, they legislated iodizing salt, putting iodine in salt. And I was taught in medical school that um, you iodize salt and the goiter went away. And uh, that was the end of iodine deficiencies. Uh, it turns out that iodized salt is just barely enough to prevent goiter. And the iodine and the iodized salt is in a form that's not very well absorbed. So Brownstein believes that you need 10 to 50 milligrams um, per day of iodine in the form of I- minus and I2. Typically I minus, um, they'll use potassium iodine, and iodide is I2, which is just elemental iodine. And um, he was um, treating some patients with um, supersaturated potassium iodine, which is I minus, and he found out that he had a better rate of success if he gave them both I minus and I2. So apparently some of the body's tissues uh, use I minus, and some of the body's tissues use I2 or I'm sorry, are able to absorb I2, and some are able to absorb I minus. So um, you found out that if you use both, um, you get a better rate of absorption and people get better. Uh, the problem is that in America, um, they use bromine in commercial bakery products and sports drinks and also fluoride in some toothpaste. And it turns out that in the uh, Lower Colorado River region, there was a perchlorate spill. Uh, the military spilled some perchlorate in the Colorado River. And so um, plants and even organic vegetables that were raised with Colorado River water um, tend to have perchlorate in them. The problem is that bromine, uh, fluoride, 
perchlorate. These take the place of iodine in the body and may actually displace um, iodine in the body and may actually poison you. And so the th the um, it, it could be that perhaps um, the thyroid hormone may have, um, instead of having an iodine around the thyroid hormone, it's usually T3 or T4. Three means three iodines. Four means four iodines around the base of the th uh, of the thyroid hormone. It could be that these may be replaced with bromine or fluoride. And so as you know, um, for the chemistry buffs there in the in periodic table, bromine, fluoride, um, they're all in the same area of the periodic table. So these, these can take the place of iodine in the body. And what he found is if he gave 10 to 50 milligrams of iodine um, per day, bromine and um, fluoride began to be um, pushed out of the body. And so when this happened, um, people began to improve. So um, Brownstein, if you get his book, he has a number of um, um, uh, uh, cases where he gave them iodine and they actually improved greatly their hypothyroid symptoms, uh, the pain in the fibrocystic breast disease, and he has some quite nice statistics on them. I had another uh, patient also where she went on our list of avoidance, took progesterone, and nothing happened to her fibroid. And then she began to take iodine, and within about three or four weeks, the fibroids started to disappear. So if you go and read um, Brownstein's book, and I encourage you to do so, um, he had some quite good results with iodine. And it seems that iodine, I don't quite understand it, and I don't think he does either, but it seems that the proper iodine intake can decrease estrogen sensitivity. He points to um, Japan, um, where people eat uh, 10, 10 milligrams of iodine via um, seaweed and uh, he he thinks that um, fibrocystic breast disease is decreased in Japan because of the increased iodine intake from seaweed. So um, let's talk about um, how to use progesterone and um, well basically remember that anything that you put on the skin is 10 times the oral dose in potency and this is because anything you put on the skin bypasses the liver. Um, anything you take orally is 90% inactivated by liver because the liver gets to work on it. Also, you have to remember that anything taken vaginally or rectally is also 90% inactivated by the liver. As you recall, if you take a, va a vaginal um, progesterone suppository or a rectal progesterone suppository, that area of the body is drained by the portal vein, for those of people who know anatomy, and the portal vein goes straight to the liver. And again, it's 90% inactivated. So again, um, I, I cannot emphasize more that a 20 milligram topical dose of progesterone is equivalent to a 200 milligram dose taken orally, vaginally, or rectally. I usually recommend my patients to take progesterone twice per day. Um, or at bedtime if they get too sleepy taking progesterone. Uh, if you take progesterone at night to, to go to sleep, I have a number of patients that take it just to go to sleep. Be careful when you wake up that you don't fall and trip and um, break a bone or something. So again, the levels go, if you put the progesterone on the skin, the progesterone will go up and down in seven hours. And for some people who are bleeding, uh, you may have to take progesterone three times a day. So I did have one patient uh, who would wake up early in the morning, take progesterone at 5 o'clock, and she'd come home late at night, take progesterone at 11, and she'd always have breakthrough bleeding at 1 o'clock. So once she figured that out, she broke up her progesterone dose into three doses, one at 6, one at 1, or maybe 12, and one late at night, and then she didn't have any problems with bleeding. Make sure that you rotate the areas topically, so one day it's the right arm, one day it's the left arm, one day it's the right leg, one day it's the left leg, one day it's the chest, one day it's the back. And the reason why is that if you keep doing right arm, right arm, right arm, the progesterone goes into the skin and there's a layer of fat underneath the skin called the subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous just means under the skin fat. And this subcutaneous fat begins to saturate and you can't absorb any more progesterone. So make sure you rotate areas uh, because the progesterone, because you keep on putting on the same area, you can't absorb any more progesterone. So remember the progesterone will go throughout the whole body. Okay. And um, 
Some women with migraines um, like to take it sublingually or underneath the tongue, but again the dose is less. So topically a dose of progesterone of 20 milligrams is equivalent to a dose uh, orally of 200 milligrams. And if you put it underneath the tongue, the effective dose is somewhere between 20 and 200 milligrams. Um, because basically um, I don't know how long you keep it underneath your tongue. You might just swallow it after 10 seconds. So again, anytime you put it underneath in your body, it's divided by 10. The women who like to take it uh, for menstrual migraines, if they feel a migraine coming on, they'll kind of build up the dose. So as they think the mig menstrual migraine is coming, they're going to slowly build up their dose. And on that day, they may rub it on their temples. Sometimes they'll take it underneath their tongue. And they find that that works for them. In general, if you don't want to conceive immediately, you can take it any time you do not have a period. Again, uh, our blue booklet shows dosing for different diseases um, or different conditions that you might want to treat yourself for. But again, if you don't want to conceive immediately, you may take it any time uh, you do not have a period. So let's talk about dosing. I usually dose uh, between 20 to 60 milligrams per day topically, and all, that's what also John Lee does. And again, if you don't want to conceive it immediately, use it whenever you do not have a period. If you have a mild condition, and, and then if you are really good about your avoidance list, you won't need any supplements after three or four months. So my goal for you is to completely be disease or condition free and to be completely normal after without even taking progesterone. So if you are really good about your avoidance list, you don't have any xenoestrogens, your hormones are normal, you should be normal. Okay, progesterone just balances out the estrogen dominance if you have a, a small estrogen load. If you have a large estrogen load, you have a paradoxical effect where you actually might get worse temporarily. And so we'll talk about that later, the side effects of progesterone. But in general, my goal for you is if you avoid all xenoestrogens, you should be normal and not need any supplements after three or four months. After all, you know, if you're in, if you're in Africa, do those African people take progesterone supplements? No, they don't. Of course not. Uh, more severe conditions may actually take six to nine months. Okay. So um, in the next uh, set of slides, we'll talk about the safety of progesterone, and you'll find out that progesterone is actually quite safe. There may be um, one or two exceptions to this, but in general, progesterone is safer than asp an aspirin uh, or acetaminophen. Uh, if you take acetaminophen and you, you take enough of that, maybe half a bottle, you die of liver failure for acetaminophen, not progesterone. And uh, everyone gets to watch and that's no fun for anybody. So again, uh, this is Women's Therapeutic Institute. Thank you for coming and hope to see you on the next set of slides where we'll be talking about the safety of progesterone. Thank you.